So uh, first of all, um, let's define what, what actually Snowflake is. Um, so Snowflake is, uh, first of all, a cloud data warehouse service, and it is uh, working on a software as a service uh, licensing model. Um, also, it is MVP database, and that processes standard uh, SQL language. And uh, now uh, Snowflake as a company doesn't want to limit their role to uh, data warehouse only. And uh, they, um, they want to be called as data platforms uh, because they, they provide a little bit more. Uh, for example, you can use Snowflake for uh, uh, as only a compute layer for querying your data in the data lake, or uh, you can do some simple uh, visualization in Snowflake. <coughs> or uh, you can manage some data pipelines also. Uh, we will see it uh, during this uh, presentation. Um, so another important point, Snowflake is a cloud platform, uh, is cloud uh, service, but it is not a service of uh, any of these uh, cloud providers. So it's a separate service, but uh, they don't have their own infrastructure, no data centers and uh, Snowflake works on uh, cloud infrastructure from uh, main cloud providers. So actually, when you uh, create Snowflake account, uh, then you, you just decide uh, whether it should be in GCP, AWS, or Azure. So let's, uh, let's check the Snowflake architecture. Uh, there are three main layers in Snowflake architecture. Uh, storage, query processing, and cloud services. Uh, so let's start from the bottom. Uh, database storage is, uh, so all data is stored in uh, cloud uh, storage. For example, if it is AWS, it is S3. And uh, I worked with Snowflake on AWS. So if I tell S3, uh, then you should understand that actually it can be uh, uh, the same service, but in other uh, cloud provider. Uh, so, uh, database is completely uh, separated from query processing. All uh, data is stored in uh, S3 and uh, all data uh, organization aspects, they are managed by Snowflake. So, uh, compression, uh, size of uh, partitions, uh, some statistics, metadata, you, you don't have a possibility to impact it. There's there's only one possibility to change clustering, but uh, still you will not uh, do it quite often. Um, so that's important to remember that database is completely separated. Uh, what about uh, processing layer? So uh, in Snowflake, it is important to understand the concept of virtual warehouse. Uh, so virtual warehouse, it is a set of compute resources only. So it stores no data, but uh, it uh, fetches data from the database storage and it can do any uh, manipulation uh, and processing of this data and returning it uh, to the user. Um, so uh, actually it is uh, in case of AWS, virtual warehouse is set of EC2 machines. Uh, uh, and the uh, uh, virtual warehouses, then they can be um, composed of one cluster with different size, or even they can uh, they can have multiple clusters of uh, different sizes of uh, uh, of compute nodes. And also, you can have multiple such virtual warehouses that can run in parallel, and they they do not share uh, computing resources between them at all. And uh, they can be different in size. You can, uh, anytime you can start them, stop them, resize them. And also uh, you can even drop all of them or suspend, but your data remains where it is. So that's an important concept in Snowflake, complete separation of uh, processing and storage layers. Uh, cloud services. In cloud services, we have everything else what is needed for running the database, like access control, query optimization, metadata, security, and, and everything else. Um, are there any questions right now? If not, then let's uh, have a look to Snowflake Web UI. 
so uh, Snowflake provides the interface where you can uh, where you can run your queries, uh, browse your uh, databases, uh, do any uh, settings of your account. Um, so I, I have here a, a trial account and. It is very easy to open this trial account and they give you uh, $300 uh, and it's really enough to, to do all the trainings. Uh, so if you need it, you, you can, I would suggest you to do it. Uh, so what we can do here, for example, we, we just have a regular editor where we can uh, run our SQL st uh, statements, we can browse our database. We can, we have separate menu where uh, we can check all the database objects. Uh, we can do some data sharing. We can check our virtual warehouses. So this is uh, the compute layer. As you can see, I have here nine different warehouses. They are all suspended. I can drop them, create them again. The data remains where it is. Uh, also, uh, we have a uh, query history here. We can do some, uh, we can check execution plans. For example, we will do it later during this presentation. Um, also, there is a new interface in preview. And uh, it is interesting because it uh, gives you some data visualization possibilities. Also, it, it has worksheets where you can run queries, but uh, you can do some simple dashboards out of that queries. So, uh, of course, it is not a replacement of tools like Tableau or Power BI, but uh, anyway, for some simple scenarios, maybe it will be sufficient. Uh, so that's the first step and uh, I'm sure Snowflake will, uh, will extend this functionality. So for now it is static, but user can update uh, this dashboard using buttons. Um, so that's about interface. We will come back here later. Um, let's continue with uh, those uh, architecture layers uh, more detailed. So uh, um, the storage layer. Uh, all tables in Snowflake are divided into micro partitions. Uh, so uh, here you can see the example how uh, such table can be split into several micro partitions. All micro partitions are in columnar format. Uh, they are compressed and uh, Everything, uh, all these aspects are managed by Snowflake. Uh, compression algorithms, uh, they are applied uh, uh, <coughs> separately for each column and you cannot change them. If you think they are not optimal, you, you just have to believe that they uh, make optimal decisions. Uh, also, so what is important about micro partitions is that uh, Snowflake manages uh, metadata about each column in each micro partition. So for example, if we are running query to this table and we write uh, the condition where date equals 11.5, uh, then Snowflake will know that actually these uh, three micro partitions, they should not be scanned because there is no such data and only one will be scanned. So it, it helps to run queries faster. And uh, this, this process of skipping micro partitions in Snowflake terminology, it is called pruning of micro partitions. Um, of course, here it is simplified example because uh, in reality, if you have such small table, it would not need four micro partitions. There will be only one because this is the size of, uh, of micro partitions usually. So that's... That's how data is stored. You should remember that tables are divided into micro partitions. Let's continue uh, about uh, compute layer. So you know that virtual warehouses are uh, sets of compute resources and uh, Snowflake consumes, uh, well, running warehouses, they consume Snowflake credits while they are running. Each credit costs, uh, costs from two to three dollars. It depends on the cloud platform you uh, selected and the region uh, you selected. Um, in Snowflake, most of uh, your uh, costs will be uh, composed of compute costs. Uh, storage is not free, but it is usually cheap. Uh, so uh, 
here are possible sizes of uh, one cluster of the virtual warehouse. So uh, the biggest is 128. And uh, this is one cluster, but uh, as I told, there are single cluster and multi-cluster virtual warehouses in Snowflake. Multi-cluster virtual warehouses can have up to 10 clusters. So uh, the biggest possible virtual warehouse in Snowflake can have uh, 1,280 servers. And well, if it is for some reason not enough, you can create one more like this. And uh, it will not be cheap for sure. Um, so you, you can resize uh, those warehouses at any time, uh, even while they're executing queries. Uh, but if uh, it is executing <coughs> some query and you resize it, that then uh, exactly this query will not gain from the new resources, but uh, all, all new queries that will be assigned to this warehouse, they, they will consume complete, uh, complete set of servers. Um, so why we have single cluster and multi-cluster warehouses? Um, the idea is to uh, use single cluster warehouses and uh, scale them when you want to speed up uh, large complex queries. So uh, multi-cluster warehouses uh, should be used for high concurrency. It is uh, uh, a common mistake in Snowflake to think that if you have a single cluster and you uh, run many heavy queries in parallel, then uh, you can scale it and it will start running uh, queries instead of queuing. It will not. So uh, the idea of single cluster warehouse is just to use complete uh, um, uh, complete power of uh, this cluster for one heavy query. But if this query is really heavy, if there are uh, many small queries, then of course single cluster warehouse can run them in parallel. But uh, multi-cluster warehouses are designed for, uh, uh, for running uh, high con concurrency. For example, so if you have some reporting tool that is uh, refreshing several dashboards at the same time and each dashboard uh, needs a whole set of historical data, then multi-cluster warehouse uh, will see that uh, there, are queue, there are new queries that are queuing and it will launch new clusters uh, up to 10. When, the, uh, when there are no uh, uh, many parallel queries anymore, then it will scale down so it will, it will uh, shut down additional clusters and it can run uh, only one cluster. So that's important difference about single and multi-cluster um, warehouses. Uh, let's see here, here how can we distinguish between single and multi-cluster warehouses in Snowflake UI. Um, so when you open warehouses, you, you see the list of them and their properties like the size, so medium, it has four clusters, small has two clusters and, uh, sorry, not clusters, but servers. And here we can see the clusters. Uh, so it means that this warehouse uh, can scale from uh, one to three uh, clusters. This one cannot scale, so it has maximal one, so it's a single cluster. Um, uh, the scaling, the scaling is done, as I said, based on uh, based on how queries are queued. So Snowflake uh, can estimate how much capacity is needed to execute some new query. If it is really simple, then it, it will be executed without launching new cluster. If not, then, then new cluster will be launched and the queries will execute completely in parallel. They they will not make uh, one dashboard will not make the other the other dashboard to uh, to to have lower performance. Um, you can also run multi-cluster warehouse not in such auto-scale mode, but in maximized mode. So if you uh, make minimum and maximal number of clusters three, then you will always have three clusters. It can be suitable if you if your concurrency level is not fluctuating and you know that all the time there are uh, three uh, reports that query a lot of data and they need it, then, then you can uh, make it in maximized mode. There are some different uh, scaling policies. We will not go so uh, deep into details. And uh, virtual warehouses can auto suspend when they're inactive and uh, auto resume when you try to connect to them. So, so if you are not doing anything, it will shut down and will not consume, consume your, uh, your credits. 
what are the scenarios when we uh, should use multiple virtual warehouses? Uh, so first of all, in Snowflake, it is recommended to um, um, to have uh, dedicated virtual warehouses for different environments and for uh, different uh, process loads. So for example, for production, it makes sense to have a reporting virtual warehouse that is larger because it can really query all historical data. And if you know that there will be some uh, parallelism, you can uh, create it multi-cluster. So let's say it will scale up to four clusters. But for loading the data, uh, if you do it incrementally in uh, no, not so big batches, so uh, a smaller warehouse might be sufficient and single cluster. And uh, at the same time, we can have the same set of uh, virtual warehouses for test environment, because, well, we don't want to, uh, our tests to, um, to slow down performance of production operations. So it, they will run completely separately. Uh, and also during this time, some, uh, some developer, for example, can do some investigation on production data and uh, he can use, uh, he or she can use separate virtual warehouse and uh, it will also not, not affect at all any production operations. So this is one uh, possible scenarios how, why you should use uh, many virtual warehouses. Um, the other one, uh, in Snowflake there are, there are several uh, editions like standard edition, enterprise edition, business critical and uh, virtual private Snowflake. They differ uh, by uh, the functions that you will have and by the by the price of your credits. Uh, for example, if you have the lowest edition, standard edition, then uh, you will not be able to uh, to use multi-cluster warehouses. But, but still, if you know that uh, you have some, uh, some concurrency, for example, you have Tableau and Power BI and they, uh, they run at the same time and they refresh uh, big data sets. Uh, so you can just dedicate separate virtual warehouses for them. And it will actually work like, like multi-cluster, but it, it cannot scale on based on demand. So any questions about compute layer or virtual warehouses? Okay. Then let's let's check how the data loading can be done. Um, so in Snowflake, you load data uh, using files, uh, and you can uh, load the files from from all cloud uh, providers, the most popular, and it's no matter what, what is your main cloud provider. Um, for example, even if you opened your Snowflake in uh, uh, in AWS, you can load from G from GCP. Also, you can load from any local environment. Uh, here is the list of supported file formats. So everything the most frequently used is supported and compression methods. Uh, it is uh, recommended, of course, to compress uh, files. Uh, so date is loaded using stages. Uh, stages in Snowflake are database objects that, that just contain some information about files, where the files are located, what is the type, and some other attributes. So you create stages using uh, just uh, DDL SQL. Um, stages can be internal or external. External stage, it is uh, if you uh, if you use S3 and you just uh, dedicate one, one bucket for uh, staging your data that you are going to load to Snowflake, then uh, you create external stage. If you, if you don't use S3, maybe you don't use AWS at all or no other cloud providers, then you can uh, push data from some local environment uh, into Snowflake stage. So create put data and uh, then uh, copy a statement, uh, moves data from files into table. When data is in table, then it is in optimized format. All micro partitions are created and they are, uh, it is optimized for uh, fast uh, querying. 
there are two main uh, solutions for loading data in Snowflake, uh, bulk load and continuous load. Uh, so bulk load, of course, is uh, suggested to be used when you have regular loads of uh, big amounts of data. Um, if you use bulk load, so what you should care about, you should prepare your files, put them, for example, in S3, uh, can be also other uh, clouds uh, storage, and then you can use stage or you can not use stage and you just execute copy statement, you open a regular connection to Snowflake, uh, execute copy statement and data is moved from files into the table. Um, it is, uh, it's recommended to use stages because uh, you don't need to repeat the same information in copy statement, but it's not required. And the other possibility is uh, continuous loading with uh, Snowflake. So uh, Snowflake has a function for it called Snowpipe. Um, Snowpipe is, is actually a database object that also can be just created using uh, DDL SQL. And it just contains copy statement that should be executed on a regular basis. So when you, uh, when you use continuous uh, load with Snowflake, all you should care about it is to put your data on S3. Everything else is executed by Snowflake uh, automatically. You, you just need to set up uh, SQS uh, once before you start using it. Uh, it's quite simple, like set up SQS and pipes. It's like three or four steps on uh, AWS site and on Snowflake site. And uh, and that's all, you just push your day, your, your files in S3 and they appear in, in the table. Uh, the, the maximal uh, delay according to Snowflake can be like a few minutes depending on the size. So let's summarize the, uh, the two approaches for loading data, bulk load and continuous load. So of course the, the purpose is different, whether we load the big batches or uh, frequently load small batches. Uh, for bulk load, we uh, manually run copy statements. Uh, for continuous load, they, they are executed in background because we just have to create pipe once. And uh, the other important difference is compute resources. Uh, for bulk loading, you uh, execute your statements in a regular Snowflake session. You, you provide virtual warehouses like, like you do any operation in Snowflake. Uh, but for continuous loading, uh, Snowflake is, uh, is using a serverless approach. So uh, compute, uh, uh, compute nodes will be uh, will be resized based on Snowflake uh, decisions. Like you cannot uh, affect it. Snowflake will just will just assign as many resources as it, as it th thinks uh, it is needed. And of course you will get a bill for all the uh, credits that were consumed. So that's about data loading. Any questions so far? Have you used uh, the pipes on your project? No, we didn't have need for pipes. So we used only bulk loading, but I created pipes only just for myself for training when I prepared for uh, certification. Mm -hmm. So it, you it said like ma maximum a couple of minutes, but maybe like on average, is it still seconds or minutes? Um, uh, minutes, it is for a bigger amount of data. So uh, when I did tra trainings, it was like maybe thousands of rows. It, it was almost instant. But is it possible to scale somehow if you have like really large uh, uh, data? It is scaling, but it is scaling uh, in serverless, uh, serverless model. So Snowflake is scaling it. If there are uh, more data, it will scale, but I think they uh, they say that uh, they say that it may be in minutes because maybe they, they just want to to be safe if you mm -hmm. really start running a lot of uh, data through the pipe and if they cannot do it uh, uh, instantly then mm -hmm. they reserve it the right for them to to do it in minutes but i think in most of cases it, it will be seconds okay thank you one more question 
uh, yeah. So uh, if you, if it possible, uh, no. How it works uh, when uh, file? I, I mean continuous loading. Uh, when we load some file, uh, is it possible to move this file after loading to the other folder uh, in, for example, GCS or uh, S3? Uh, or what will happen with file after loading in uh, continuous loading? Right. It will remain where it is, uh, but uh, Snowflake uh, knows that this file was already loaded and uh, next time if you put new batch of files, only new uh, files will be loaded. So if you want to, uh, to move them somewhere else after loading, then, then you have to implement something on your side. So mm -hmm. Snowflake is not doing that. And if I put uh, a new file with the same name, uh, with new data, uh, and this file won't be loaded, yes? Uh, I haven't tried, but I assume yes. It will think that this is the file uh, that was already loaded. Mm -hmm. so it it, it marks like this some. file loaded uh, only for a file name, yes? Not for, not using date. Of I, cannot, this I file. cannot really tell you for sure, but I think yes. I think it is using name, but. Okay, thank well, you. If I needed uh, this specific case, then I would actually double check. Okay, great. Um, so, um, any other questions? So let's continue with something a bit more practical example. So uh, caching. Uh, in Snowflake, there are two levels of uh, caches. So as you know, all data is stored on S3. And uh, when virtual warehouses uh, get some data from, uh, from the database in S3, um, they store uh, this, uh, this data in their local SSD storage just for future reuse in case, in case it is needed for next queries. Also, when the query is executed, uh, then the result of the query is stored in the cloud services layer. So let's say if other virtual warehouses decides to execute identical query and based on metadata, Snowflake knows that underlying data hasn't changed, then the query will not be executed. It will just reuse already uh, prepared result. So uh, result cache uh, is interesting because it can be reused between uh, different virtual warehouses and uh, uh, local disk cache cannot be reused. So it is like stored only locally for, uh, for each virtual warehouse. Uh, let's try to, to run some queries and see how caching works. Um, so let's create some simple table with uh, random data, uh, one, Hundred thousand rows should be enough. And I want to check execution plan. So the table has created. So there is simple execution plan, like some table scan, some sorting and result is returned. Uh, let's try to uh, switch to another virtual warehouse and execute the same query again. So uh, this time we used the virtual warehouse. Now I'll switch to virtual warehouse dev2 and execute the identical query. So, What's the execution plan? Now we can see that uh, there are no steps because the query was not executed uh, and just result was reused. E even it was uh, done in uh, other virtual warehouse, but it could use it. So it is like hot data read. Uh, let's check how uh, hot data read and it is the uh, result cache layer. Uh, let's check how, uh, uh, how server's cache uh, layer works. Uh, so we can switch again to the first uh, virtual warehouse and execute similar query, but we will sort by uh, other column so that it cannot reuse the result. 
and we'll see what is the execution plan. Uh, so this time query was executed. Uh, there was some scan also sort, uh, but what is interesting here that uh, scan was done from cache. So we can see that uh, all data was fetched, uh, not from, from the database storage, but from local storage of the virtual warehouse. Um, so the, the table is quite small, so it has six micro partitions, all of them were scanned uh, because, because we use no where uh, clauses, so of course it is full scan. Uh, let's okay. try, yeah? Uh, if you had to correct some data, will it know that it has to be built cache for that particular? Do you mean if the data has changed? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, if any data is changed, then of course cache is not used. Uh, uh, Snowflake manages it based on metadata. So, uh, uh, let me come back here. Uh, so, in cloud services layer, you have metadata uh, manager, and Snowflake knows that uh, some specific micro partition was uh, whether it is still valid or not. So, if it was uh, changed, then of course cache is not used. You should not worry about uh, showing uh, old data. So. Cache, cache is reused only if data remains the same. That's for sure. Are there any configuration options for the cache, like maybe for invalidating? So no. No, no. You, you cannot really affect it. So this cache, uh, result cache is stored for 24 hours after the query was executed last time. And uh, this cache uh, time based for, okay yeah uh, for, for sure i don't know how much uh, this cache for how long this cache is stored but uh, you cannot configure it well snowflake is really managed service you 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 have very limited impact here on any operations so that's that's how warm data can be queried uh let's check called data so uh, we can switch to the the third uh, virtual house and execute some new query so again what is the execution plan um, so there was some scan and there was some sorting and uh, so nothing was scanned from cache because it is new virtual warehouse. Uh, it doesn't have this cache yet, but if you execute it again, then it will use it. Um, so that was that was called, called the data query. Any other questions here? So, well, you just have to know that uh, this cache uh, exists and it works and uh, if possible, Snowflake will reuse it. If, if not, then, then no. And we should not worry, of course, that uh, <clears throat> there is some uh, out of date data used by cache. Um, in Snowflake, there are many uh, extensions to SQL language. Um, Let's check some of them that, that I found very useful. So for example, multi-table insert. Uh, you can actually uh, run one statement that will uh, insert into multiple tables. It is very useful because, for example, you can uh, decide uh, that, uh, define how uh, proper records goes into target, uh, target tables and how invalid records will go to some error table. So for example, here, some transactions, this positive amount will go to fact table and others can be inserted into two different tables. Uh, so there is no limit on uh, those conditions here and uh, you can write more complex uh, conditions. They can be overlapping. Uh, they can insert into multiple tables. Uh, so in my example, the conditions are not overlapping, overlapping so I have insert first. Uh, first means that uh, for each uh, row, the first condition that is true 
it will be executed and uh, this row will not be checked uh, for other conditions. But uh, you can also add one more condition when amount is more than 10 and uh, change this keyword to uh, from first to all and then uh, then records uh, that are uh, that have amount more than 10 they will be inserted into this table and into the other table that you will specify later so i, I haven't seen such uh, such multi table inserts in other database that I that I used in my experience. Maybe if you have seen the such examples, then then please tell. That would be interesting to know. So for sure, not uh, it doesn't exist in Redshift, uh, SQL Server, uh, Postgre, MySQL. Quite useful thing. It makes your code uh, smaller and quite readable. Uh, the other uh, nice feature is qualify. Uh, so when you, uh, usually when you uh, run Windows functions, functions and you want a filter by its result, you should wrap your query into subquery and only then you can uh, uh, filter using where close. Um, in Snowflake, there is a qualify operator that helps you uh, to filter by Windows functions in the same query. So uh, there is no performance improvement from it, but it just makes the code more readable and smaller. So I think it's a nice feature. Maybe maybe some of you uh, saw something like this in other databases, then please let me know. I haven't seen. One more example. Um, uh, when we uh, played with caches, we, uh, we used a result already cached results. Uh, it is also possible to uh, to use result uh, caches explicitly. So for example, you can run query like this. Select from and you uh, write uh, function result scan and you provide the ID of the query. Um, uh, so so for example, it can be useful for uh, such cases when uh, you want to, uh, to apply some uh, complex conditions to, uh, to queries to uh, metadata, like show parameters, describe something, show table, create. And uh, in this example, for example, we first check uh, parameters and then we uh, run query which shows uh, where uh, value is not equal to default one. You can, you can also get those uh, uh, query uh, IDs from the query history. It is here. Uh, there, are, uh, there are many more uh, extensions. For example, uh, uh, many functions for uh, working with JSON data in Snowflake for flattening this data. Uh, we will see one of them in uh, one other exercise. Um, so let's let's continue then, if if there are no questions. Okay, so uh, cloning uh, in Snowflake there is uh, quite important uh, operation cloning, and uh, it is it is different from. Uh, from creating table, like when you can uh, write uh, the statement, create table uh, as select from the other table. Cloning is different because cloning is metadata only operation. So it creates uh, additional table, but uh, it will refer to the same micro partitions that, that are already created. And <clears throat> since it is metadata only operation, it is very fast. And of course, if uh, the data in original table starts changing, then, then uh, all proper manipulations will be done and micro partitions will be copied. But until it is not, uh, you have uh, one more table that uh, doesn't uh, store, uh, doesn't consume more storage and uh, you can assign separately permissions to this table. And uh, uh, it is just created fast because there, there is no actual data being copied. Um, uh, it can be useful, for example, if you are doing some custom backups, uh, 
In general, in Snowflake, there is a special solution for backups. I will explain it in the next slides, but uh, in some cases you will need uh, custom backups. So th then you can just run clone. Uh, and you can clone tables, schemas, databases. Um, so let's uh, go to, uh, to the next slide. We will uh, speak about backups and we'll see some examples how, how to use cloning. Um, so backup and recovery. Uh, actually, in Snowflake, there, there, there are no separate processes for uh, creating backups or, or snapshots. Um, but just uh, data that is dropped, tables that are dropped or uh, deleted, they, they just don't, uh, their micro partitions don't disappear. So they still exist where they were, but uh, metadata only changes. So actually in Snowflake, each micro partition is immutable. So if something has to be changed, then new micro partition is created. Uh, so uh, it helps to, um, to provide a feature called time travel, and it allows you to query the data in table as it was at some specified uh, timestamp or as it was before executing some specific uh, statement. And uh, uh, this retention, of course, it is not forever. It is from one to 90 days. Uh, you can define it for a specific, uh, for a specific table. Um, let's see some examples how, how it works. Recovery. Um, so let's, let's create some simple table with customers and insert their five records. So we have, we, we have the table and we have five records. Let's just uh, record the timestamp when we know for sure that the data exists in the table. Uh, now let's delete the first customer. So one record is deleted. And uh, also let's delete the rest of them. They are deleted. Uh, so the table is empty and somehow we want to, to restore the data. First of all, we can get the IDs of uh, those queries that we have just executed. So last query ID and last query ID minus two show us the most recent and the second most recent queries. So this one is here and this one is here. So, so the table is, is empty now, but uh, we can do some, some magic and uh, check how this table looked before this statement was executed. So actually it is time travel feature. We can see four records. And also we can check how this table looked even before the previous statement. So it had all, all the five records. Uh, another possibility is to, to query the table as it is, as it was at a given moment of time. So for example, here, uh, we know that at this moment, two minutes ago, it was, it was in place. Yeah, so it shows correct data. Uh, we can also use offset like here. Uh, it is. It will show how the table looked like five minutes ago, but five minutes ago it uh, didn't exist. So it should return some error, yes. Uh, before the object creation time. So that's how time travel works. Uh, another interesting uh, thing it is to undrop. So it is really great. You can drop table, undrop table, and still have it like uh, like just undo. So can be useful for people who do uh, dangerous operations directly on environments. Uh, and here we can see uh, the other example how cloning works with time travel. Um, so for example, now we uh, we restored our table, but it is um, it is empty. So we want to create the other table 
restored. Uh, that will show uh, this table, Jim customer, as it was when, when we know the data was in place. So it works. We have we have created a, a new table with the uh, all data, and that's how we can restore something. If we lost, or just do any investigation. If you you are investigating some bug, you you don't really know how the table looked at a specific moment of time when some process was running. So it is quite useful. Uh, of course, it. Uh, no data is deleted, data is retained, and it uh, consumes uh, additional credits for uh, for storage, but still it is it is very small comparing to the price of uh, uh, of running virtual warehouses. Um, you can also do uh, such clone operation not only for table but for schema and for uh, database. The same with and drop. Any questions to this? Is there a way just to, to drop in a way like to release space if you really need it? Hmm, I, I don't know. <laughs> really haven't uh, uh, checked it. But if you if you know that uh, some table uh, is not uh, uh, is not really storing important data, and you don't want to have additional charges for uh, uh, storage. Then you just uh, you can uh, set uh, this time travel retention period as one day. Or there are different types of tables, like uh, there are regular tables and transient tables in Snowflake. So you can create table as transient and. Uh, transient table will always have retention period one or maybe even zero. I don't remember for sure. So, mm -hmm. okay, thank you. If you want to avoid those additional charges, you, you can do it. Yeah, and is it possible to alter table? So, if you like created it like with default 90 days and then just put it alter yes. table? Yeah, is yes, time. for sure. So, that was about time travel. <clears throat> uh, uh, except of time travel, there is a, a feature that is like uh, uh, described as separate feature, fail safe, but actually it is just the same as time travel, but it adds you additional seven days to this period. Um, if uh, if you if you really lost some data and uh, your period ha has finished, then you can uh, ask Snowflake support to restore for you data and up to seven days, it will still be available. I haven't used it, so I don't know really how fast they uh, respond. So the best, of course, it is not to rely on this case and to do everything in time travel period. Uh, so the bad news about it are that if you, if you use only a standard Snowflake edition, uh, that is the cheapest, then uh, time travel period for you is uh not more than one day <laughs> well, yes yes for sure one day so it is just not enough for sure and if you use standard edition then first of all better not to use standard edition use uh, enterprise but uh, if the costs are really concerned and you use it then you can uh, implement your custom jobs uh, using cloning that would i would suggest and when you create a clone, it is a, se a separate table, and uh, if the uh, time travel period for your source table has changed, then data will still be uh, remaining in the clone. That's about data recovery. So, one more uh, important uh, and interesting feature in Snowflake, it is managing data pipelines. Uh, so uh, when you spoke about continuous loading, you, uh, 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 you saw how data can be moved from stages using Snowpipe uh, directly into staging table. So, so uh, also in Snowflake, it is possible to optimize the transformation part and you can have some streams and tasks that will transform your data from the raw state into some fax dimensions or whatever. Uh, 
um, streams are uh, objects that uh, uh, that can uh, show you all only change data in uh, in the table that they are tracking um, tasks tasks are, are just some regular jobs that are executed on on the schedule so uh, let's have some practical example how it works streams so i will first run a bunch of statements and then i will will explain them one by one because during this time it will it will be executing yeah so i just wanted to ask so there is no such thing like stored procedures right there are uh, there are stored procedures and actually in the task you can run a single query or run stored procedure but uh, stored procedures uh, i haven't used them because when i started the project uh, they were not available they added it quite recently uh, stored procedures are in javascript uh, but mm -hmm. still they allow you to run a normal sql code but it is like in uh, it is like in dynamic sql uh, style so you prepare a big string of sql code and then you feed it to some javascript uh, operator and then it is executed but they are they they exist stored procedures but i haven't tried to use them okay thank you um so uh so this batch of statements was executed let's uh, check one by one what we were doing it so we just decide which virtual warehouse we use uh, what's the database what is the schema uh, here we create a landing table where we will uh, put uh, raw data so uh, data type is variant here in snowflake variant it is for it is data type for unstructured data so we will put uh, for semi-structured data we will put a json here um, stream stream it is a database object uh, that tracks changes on some table here we uh, define that stream should uh, return changes on landing row so only unprocessed changes will be uh, will be returned uh here we have uh, the final target table for some transformed data so we, we will have some payments here that are first in json and they will be converted into a uh, structured format um, the next is the task so task uh, as i said task it is just a regular job uh, it has assigned the virtual warehouse that it will use uh, it has uh, some schedule every minute it is actually the smallest interval uh, that's why i first executed it and then uh, started explaining uh, it will be executed only when the stream has data because stream shows only unprocessed data after this task will process the data the stream will be empty uh, and here uh, we show what what the task actually is doing um, uh, it can be stored procedure here uh, but we have just merge statement so we uh, we take data from uh, from the stream uh, stream returns data in the same format as, as it is in the uh, in its table so it is variant it will be json and uh, here we just convert uh, uh, we get separate uh, elements from json uh, so when matched we update when not much we insert uh, we resume that task and here i uh, inserted uh, two rows into landing table and uh, after it was inserted we queried uh, the stream and uh, stream shows these two records and some additional metadata like uh, whether it was uh, inserted or updated and some row id uh, so at the moment when i executed this query the stream contained two records now uh, i i think it should be already processed and the stream should be empty if it is not then i will be surprised it is so it means that uh, our task has executed because one minute for sure has passed and the stream is already empty and we should actually see the uh, the data in our payments table yeah so it is in place we can see ids so that's how you can you can manage some data transformations in snowflake uh, what is also interesting is that you can uh, create hierarchy of tasks uh, 
Uh, one task can have uh, child tasks, uh, but it is not really enough flexible from my point of view, because for example, you cannot have a, a child task that has two parents. So you don't really, you, you cannot do uh, some complex flows there. Uh, another problem with uh, task hierarchies is that uh, Snowflake cannot guarantee that a child tasks uh, are not executed in parallel when uh, the previous instance hasn't finished and the new one is starting. Uh, so I think it's not really acceptable because, well, there may be some data corruption if uh, you start merging into one table from two different sessions. So it's it's not, not really good. So I think that uh, this uh, continuous data pipelines are quite good uh, function for uh, for some simple transformations, simple flows, but maybe they will uh, they will extend it later and uh, it will be more usable. Uh, I haven't used it uh, this in my project because uh, because it was not yet available and also I don't think it, it would be suitable for uh, for our case. Um, any questions to this? Yeah, maybe general question. Um, yep. You worked with AWS, uh, but uh, I believe they already worked with Azure as well, right? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yes, so they can be executed like in GCP and in Azure. Yeah, but is it mature enough, in your opinion? Not sure. To be honest, not sure. Uh, when I started working with Snowflake, only AWS and Azure was uh, supported and there were some limitations for Azure for sure. I know, uh, then I didn't track it. So th there, are, there are many changes every, every two weeks from Snowflake. I don't follow everything. Uh, uh, for sure, uh, AWS is always the most mature. Uh, not sure about others. Okay, thank you. And yeah, sorry, I just missed the beginning part. Um, That's okay. Do, do you have a like uh, feeling how much does it cost? <laughs> yeah, like some numbers. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, it depends on your use case, of course. I um, can tell you about credits. Uh, not sure whether you were at this slide. No, no. So, yeah, uh, in Snowflake, in Snowflake, you pay by credits, uh, and uh, most of uh, credits you will pay by uh, compute uh, for compute layer. Um, uh, there is one-to-one -one, uh, dependency between the number of servers and the number of credits per hour, uh, and one credit costs between two and three dollars. So, just have to estimate it. And uh, in general, it is. It is always uh, needed to to do some experiments uh, to to figure out what is uh, for you suitable size to have uh, to have a good performance and mm -hmm. not too much cost. Because, for example, uh, you can scale the virtual warehouse and it looks like it should cost more, uh, but uh, it executes the query much faster and in total it can be cheaper. So, without experiments, you, you cannot really tell it. Mm -hmm. But did did you do some exercises in comparison to Redshift, for example? Uh, yeah, maybe just understanding. Yeah, in terms of cost? Level. Yeah, yes. Uh, no, in terms of cost, I, I didn't do. I, I think it is like, you have to take very specific example, mm -hmm. specific queries, model it, because mm -hmm. the, everything mm -hmm. is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, so yeah, sorry, uh, if you continue about cost. So if you have like, your data warehouse right in snowflake and so each time like report running some query against snowflake it requires some computation capacity which is should be paid uh, yes yes mm -hmm. yes and you pay by uh, by hour of running but actually it is uh, the uh, uh, they counted by minutes but uh, mm -hmm. in total you, and you, it, it, yeah. Yes, and if, if if the cache is used, it's still like counted or not? Uh, it counts, uh, but if the cache is used, then it just takes less time. 
Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, but uh, depends depends of course which cache. So, for example, uh, if result cache is used, um, well, not sure. Maybe for result cache, maybe it is not. Maybe it is not needed to have virtual warehouse. Uh, I will I would have to double check it. But I think actually that uh, such examples like we have here show parameters and uh, use result scan. Mm -hmm. um, it might be uh, possible to execute it without uh, virtual warehouse. There are many uh, metadata only operations that, that for sure don't need virtual warehouse. For example, uh, delete everything from table. So virtual warehouse is not needed because uh, when you delete everything from table, it just uh, marks those uh, micro partitions uh, invalid. That's all. Uh, but well, for, for queries, when you query data mm -hmm. and if you don't use result scan, then for sure uh, costs are tracked. Okay, and uh, yeah, maybe the last question from my side, like general question. So after your uh, hands-on experience on your project, would you recommend uh, Snowflake <laughs> to, to others? Yes, yes. Uh, I think, uh, so I can compare Snowflake with Redshift uh, mm -hmm. a little bit because, uh, well, I didn't work with other uh, cloud uh, data warehouse technologies. So, uh, Comparing with Redshift, I think there are more advantages here. Uh, speaking only about functionality, not, not considering the costs. In terms of costs, it might be more expensive mm -hmm. depending on your scenarios, yep. I cannot tell it. But uh, in Redshift, you, you don't have all that flexibility with having uh, many, many compute clusters and uh, scaling them uh, fast, uh, dropping them. Uh, so even uh, with Redshift, when you have those new, uh, RA3 nodes, it is still not the same. However, they claim it is, uh, there is separation between storage and compute. It is really separated, but still you cannot have there two different clusters and assign one to reporting and the other for, for loading data or assign them to different environments, production or test environment. Um, so uh, in general, I, I see more advantages in Snowflake. Uh, but, well, th there are some also disadvantages. For example, uh, so Snowflake is not so tightly integrated with all the other uh, AWS services like DMS. So you cannot replicate uh, data using DMS into Snowflake uh, or um, what else? Uh, in Snowflake, you, you should always remember that uh, standard edition is very much limited. So you don't have multi, uh, multi-cluster warehouses, you don't have materialized views, uh, time travel period is only one day. So, well, real Snowflake, I think, starts from enterprise edition. Um, uh, so uh, also what I like about Redshift uh, is that DDL uh, is transactional. So you can uh, wrap a bunch of DDL statements into a transaction, transaction in Redshift and you can roll back them if needed. It helps a little bit with deployments. In Snowflake, you cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe as yeah, the last question. So uh, how big data volume uh, was on your like project? How much data you, you loaded into Snowflake? Um, on our project, we uh, we processed a lot of data into staging area uh, uh, because we were doing the full loads. We, we didn't have possibility to do incremental queries. And uh, so in general, our staging archive was like 10 terabytes uh, and uh, daily there was like 400 gigabytes loaded. Uh, data was processed, some was cleaned up, some was moved to uh, the data warehouse and the total size of the data warehouse was like uh, 100 gigabytes. Uh, we used uh, medium uh, uh, virtual warehouse for, uh, for loading data. However, it, it it would would be good to scale it at that project and for uh, for querying well uh, they use large or extra large but um, it, it will not really give you some 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 idea because the the queries are different and uh, no query uh, was fetching complete data warehouse for 100 gigabytes but um, but in general you when when we uh, operate with hundreds of gigabytes in data warehouse, then I think that up to extra large should be, should be enough. 
if you are not doing something very, mm -hmm. I don't know, something too exotic. How long does it take to load 100 gigs? Uh, to load 100 gigs, uh, so I didn't load them with one watch. It was uh, size of uh, complete data warehouse. Um, how much it takes it depends on your cluster. So uh, uh, it is recommended to split data into files and uh, better to have many smaller files than a few big ones and then they can be uh, processed in parallel. So I, I don't have a specific answer for how much time it will take to load 100 gigabytes. Yeah. Can you give you, can you give example with with your case like this size and this time frame? Um, so we had like as I said during the day we we loaded four hundred gigabytes, uh, but uh, uh, it was not only one job. It was executed uh, every two hours, and uh, each time it took. It took, uh, it took uh, like one hour, but it was not only loading, but also data processing. So I, I don't have such statistics. And well, anyway, uh, we can tell that 400 gigabytes during the day uh, were, were processed in uh, every two hours. So there were like 12, 12, uh, 12 scheduled runs and uh, it was using uh, medium uh, cluster, so medium single cluster virtual warehouse. All right. Uh, can you please tell on the security perspective? I think I saw uh, a topic on how to implement integrated security from with Power BI, for example, and Snowflake. Um, and um, what um, else do we have on the Snowflake side? What, what about role level security? Uh, about role level security, mm, not sure. Uh, uh, I don't think we can uh, distinguish that uh, some uh, user or some role can uh, uh, can have access to only separate uh, roles. Um, in Snowflake, there are uh, uh, there are roles, and you assign permissions to roles, and then you you assign roles to users, uh, but permissions are table level. Um, so uh, right. th there is uh, some encryption of data uh, in, uh, in uh, business critical uh, Snowflake edition. You have some additional features like uh, private link on S3 and uh, I don't really remember all of them, but uh, um, in standard and enterprise editions, what you get it is uh, encryption of data, and uh, and uh, you should manage the the access and and roles policies on your own. So also there are some network policies you can like uh, allow access only from separate addresses. But role ro level security, I don't think it exists. What about use? Do uh, can you create like security views if there are? Uh, yes, yes. There, that's actually one uh, one more interesting topic in uh, Snowflake. Uh, I didn't include it here because I, I thought it would be too much. Um, so there is a possibility to share data between different accounts in Snowflake and uh, use secure views. Uh, secure views are actually quite specific. They they differ from the regular views in terms that uh, uh, you, uh, the user of the view will not see the execution plan. So it cannot know even the implementation details like what are the table names, uh, what are the column names. And uh, uh, the other uh, difference from secure view, in secure views is that the query execution plan is a little bit different. So uh, first of all, uh, there will always be executed a condition of the view that returns to the user only um, only uh, their piece of data and uh, it is not it will not be possible to try to guess data uh, by using um, by using so you know such uh, conditions like you can write in the view uh, some case statement that will uh, 
for example, uh, divide by zero in case if some uh, some attribute is equal to I don't know ten. Then there are, there are such techniques that that can help you to to guess uh, something about data that is not shared with you. And if there are such very specific scenarios when uh, so much of security is required, then then you can use secure views in Snowflake. Um, can you implement the, the following scenario? For example, uh, for multi-tenancy, we have three franchises, we have three different warehouses, and then can we create a, a single security view which will allow create a summary dashboard for, let's say, CEO level people, so they can query all the data. Like um, um, you can merge results from all three uh, warehouses or oh, three accounts. I don't know, uh, but uh, with that uh, security view. Um, so secure view you can create and you can implement in the secure view the condition like uh, the user equals uh, uh, the user uh, equals to current user and it will really work as for multi-tenancy approach it, it will uh, it will actually implement the role level security but I just mean it, it will not be managed by grants um, I have actually this PC in the, the other version of presentation. I didn't want to include it because I thought it's too much, but I can tell you more about secure views here. So you can create secure views and um, they will separate uh, data between tenants, but I don't think they can uh, return for some uh, for some big boss return all the data. So for big boss, there will be needed a separate view, but for uh, uh, for tenants, you, you can you, you can distinguish. So what is, uh, let me show you what's the difference between regular view and secure view. Um, so uh, this is the execution plan when you execute regular view. It will show you what is the table, what are the filters, what are the aggregations. This is the execution plan for secure view. Just, just secure view and nothing else. Uh, the other difference what I was talking about um uh, it is here uh so uh for example if you have uh some user uh that has access to all product categories except 150 uh, but this user uh, is really trying to guess whether this category exists for other tenants and then it can try to run such query and then uh, depending on the execution plan, it may or may not return the division by zero error. So secure view will uh, prevent such behavior because they will make sure that, um, they will make sure that uh, first of all, only, uh, cannot find the slide. First of all, uh, will be executed only uh, current role or current user condition in the view itself, because this view, uh, it will join the tables, for example, and then it will uh, it will have a, a where condition, where, car, where uh, current role equals some uh, role from configuration table. Thank you. Uh, there are also secure functions secure stored functions that can be used in similar way. And secure views are used uh, with data sharing. So uh, data sharing, it is a, um, data sharing is a function that, uh, that is used to share data between different accounts and uh, also you can even uh, share data with the account that um, that doesn't have snowflake at all that is not user of snowflake uh, then you can just uh, create a special reader account uh, that will have limited possibilities only it can uh, log into snowflake or establish connection and only query the data that you share with it so here's the 
simplified example how how provider can share data with consumer so you create a share share is the the object that contains some uh, some table from one schema or from multiple schemas and you share your shares to some consumers to one consumer to many of them uh, also so uh, accounts in snowflake they can be both consumers and providers uh, it is flexible you can you can play here whatever you like so in my project there uh, we had some multi-tenancy scenario and we really use those secure views and uh, uh, from the reporting tool uh, there was established a connection and uh, they uh, they used uh, sql uh, variables that uh, uh, that uh, made sure that only uh, data from one tenant will be returned to this tenant, not, not the other. Uh, can you please share this extended presentation after the, after the... Uh, well, yes, yes. I will, I will include those slides that, that were skipped into the, into the main presentation. 